Hello everyone, this is Faith of Faith and Books. How are you doing? I'm sitting here waiting to pick up my grandsons um, to watch them for the day. And I thought I would try to do a quick review, though doing a quick review of this book is not going to be fair because this was a long, just absolutely packed with facts and information that was so new to me. And, uh, you know, archaeologists have their own jargon. I, you know, there's a whole vocabulary you have to learn. And there's a whole um, conception of deep time, Earth's deep time, that just boggles my mind. Um, but I finished reading this book, Kindred, Neanderthal, Love, uh, Life, Love, Death, and Art by Rebecca Rag Sykes. And um, it was an astonishing book. It, it, I, I knew so little about Neanderthal. I mean, just vaguely knew a little bit. And then when, uh, years ago when we did our DNA, um, it came back that I was, I had 66% more Neanderthal in me than the average person. And I had no idea that we had Neanderthal in our genes. Um, so, and that's apparently a fairly new thing anyway, like since 2010, they knew that or something like that. Um, anyway, so what this woman does, and she does it really well, is she takes all, everything you could, has ever been studied about Neanderthal or thought, and she's organized it. And, um, and she, she writes very well. She, um, she starts off with, you know, the initial discoveries back in basically Victorian times and, and the conclusions drawn there. She goes into the testing methods, uh, the way they would do the digs, all these different new um, sites that have been discovered over the years and what has been found and what the various theories are. It's very technical. Um, and she goes into great depths. I never knew there was so much to know about making things from stone, <laughs> but they're lithics, which the, the Neanderthals, um, you know, formed or created, um, tools out of stone and, you know, napping and hafting and, <laughs> and flakes and uh, retouching. And there's just all these terms for these stone tools and different styles of stone tools were found in different places. And, you know, then it seemed like generations later, they got refined and it just, it was just so much information. It, a lot of it's very technical. And I know that I went way over my head and I didn't really retain it or absorb it, but it just, just the breadth of information and the complexity of the whole thing is just astonishing. Um, and I think she did a really good job organizing it. Um, it was a very thought provoking book and, uh, she writes beautifully. She did have this thing she did. What's the word I want? Um, where she would, she would start off each chapter with a very poetic, um, introduction, you know, and it, it was, it, she, you know, it was there to get you into the, your, use your imagination to see things from the perspective of Neanderthal, um, or experience it in a very, a sensual way. And, um, and I think her theory is that, you know, they were humans. Neanderthal man was, they were, you're supposed to say Neanderthal. It's Neanderthal, but I keep saying Neanderthal. I'm ignorant, but, um, they were humans, you know, they were like maybe a subspecies and um, they existed at the same time as Homo sapiens. She says 350,000 years. Now I looked it up, this was a few weeks ago, and the most I saw other people saying was 300, but I didn't do a very thorough search or anything. That just is astonishing to me that for 350,000 years, there was this species of humans. Um, that lived and now they live on in our genes, it turns out. They didn't die out, you know, completely, but they don't exist as a separate entity anymore. But um, but just the time, just grasping that deep time. And they have a whole vocabulary for talking about interglacial and different glacial times have, have different, um, you know, MI4 or, you know, I can't even remember now what it means. Um, 
they just had a different way of uh they they just have a different way of you know denoting each each time period that's uh, relevant to neanderthal existence um it was just fascinating. She she talks about their stone, you know, their stone crafting, about other things they did, hide work. They they knew how to tan. They they used um, tar and mixed with beeswax. So they obviously knew about bees, and they probably ate honey. Though there's no actual physical evidence of that, but you know, because they used beeswax, um, they just did. You know, basically they were humans, and they were hunter gatherer humans. And they interbred with us and they created beautiful things. They found okra paint, um, shells were painted. They even found an intact string. This is from so long ago. They found these things. Um, that was actually like a three ply string that we, we still make string the same way today that, that had a seashell, a painted seashell, I think on it. So obviously it was a necklace and she, you know, she's trying to counter the initial view of the Victorians that they were sort of some sort of like, you know, almost more ape-like than than um, than human than Homo sapiens. Like they were sort of a a competitor in a way of you know which one is superior. Homo sapiens has to be superior, um, and so they they were portrayed as very brutal and subhuman, and she sees that as all tied in with racism. Um, uh, is she had a lot of really complicated thoughts at the end, which I thought were was really worthwhile thinking about. Um, this I kind of agreed with her. I've kind of had some of those thoughts before, and then she sort of crystallized them. Um, but I don't know if I agree with everything she's saying. Um, uh, but anyway, now I'm losing my train of thought, and I have to get my um, grandchildren. Anyway, it was a really thought provoking book that introduced me to this area that I knew nothing about and uh, just an absolutely fascinating thing and uh, I'd, I'd like to learn more but the but I will admit that the science of it just I couldn't I knew I wasn't taking that in <laughs> so anyway oh, one thing I want to say I, I remember this was she, one thing that really bothered me <laughs> um, was that uh, and she's talking about death because in Homo sapiens, the thing that archaeologists tend to focus on is that they have burials, that they, you know, that they obviously laid out the body in a specific way and they would put little things in with the, with the, um, in the grave. Um, and that sort of was for a long time, sort of this moniker, is that the word I want? Uh, this, it showed that it was humans, you know, it was a very human behavior. Um, and Neanderthal didn't seem to do that, although they might have done it some. But um, but one thing that they did, and I don't know why she focused on this so much, because I think Homo sapiens also did, at some points did cannibalism, but they were cannibalistic. And she tries really hard to paint this in a different way, like to get away from the taboo of cannibalism. And as she looks at bonobos, you know, those like gorilla type um, creatures that I think are the closest genetically to humans and how they sometimes uh, engage in cannibalism. And she sees it as behavior that's trying to still interact with the body of some somebody who's deceased. And so she so she tries to give like this warm, fuzzy thing to cannibalism in Neanderthals. And here's the thing. I get that she's trying to counter the initial biased view that they must have been these subhuman brutes because um, they obviously weren't. They had art and they they were creative and they um, they had to work together to hunt these you know woolly mammoths and these huge animals. They had to figure out how to survive. They had family units. They interbred with us. So obviously they weren't these subhuman brutes. But on the other hand. You cannot romanticize what was brutal about them. And that's what I didn't quite get because humans are like that too. We are creative and we're problem solving and, and we love, we want to be loved and we have tight family bonds and all those great things, but we're also brutal. You know, we also do sordid, grotesque things as well. We're capable of both. And so I, I felt like she tried too hard to sort of counter by, because she wanted to counter this 
idea of Neanderthal man, um, she went too far. And I, I found it, it was less convincing to me. But anyway, I, that was, that's, I mean, I might have some other criticisms too. I did not like the little poetic thing at every chapter. It got tiresome to me. I, I could understand starting off maybe the whole book, but each chapter to, to suddenly go into this kind of um, very high poetic kind of, I think she really wanted the reader to feel emotional, like an emotional attachment to Neanderthal or Neanderthal man, the way she did. Um, and to me, that got a little bit tiresome. Anyway, I overall, I'm, I'm so glad I read this book. I started it in January. I don't know when, mid-January. It's for Historathon. It's my Historathon read for the first quarter. Next quarter, I'm going to read a book on the Middle Ages. I think I'm going to pick the one by Ian Mortimer. I have to look into it, but I've heard, I heard Christy Lewis at Dostoevsky in Space reading that for the Regency period, reading a book by Ian Mortimer. I think that's his name. And then somehow I came across a book he wrote about the Middle Ages. So I think that's the one I'm going to do for the second quarter of Historathon. Anyway, it was a good book. I'm glad I read it. It was a long, hard read. It took a lot of time, um, but I'm, I, it was worthwhile. So I'm glad I read it. All right. That's enough for now. I hope you're doing well. And if you're doing Historathon, I hope you're enjoying it. I'm only doing one book per quarter. I'm, I can't get that involved in it, but it does seem like a really, really fun project, reading project for 2023. Anyway. Okay. I will talk to you later. I hope you're doing well. Bye-bye.